And then we're going to use the king's measure. We're going to use feet. And we're going to say, okay, uh, there's our reference system. By using that coordinate origin, which is, say, at the dinner table, or the, let's call it the uh, throne, from the throne to the coordinate origin, moving out in feet. Now we can determine where we are. Yeah, we are 5,700 million feet from the throne uh, in the north direction and say 2,100 uh, feet in the east direction from the front. Now we all agree that we know where we are. Is this what we now mean we, we can use this immediately and determine we're going to go there to heaven? Well, what's the distance it is at in uh, monarchical anthropological dimensions from the front? Well, let's take a look a little further of what we mean by dimensions. If we back off and take a look at our coordinate of origin, we actually realize that we are on a latitude circle if we're on east and west. Now I need to open your minds a little bit, get you away from that reference frame, uh, it can, we have many types of reference frames, and to realize what we really are talking about are manifolds. Measurement manifolds. What's a manifold? Well, that loop of an east-west latitude, we call a one-dimensional manifold. And in this case, it's closed. It's complete. On the east-west latitude of uh, 37 north, we can go very definitely stay on that ring and have a complete measure. That's a one-dimensional manifold. Now, if we open that manifold up in two dimensions, uh, we can be at the surface of a sphere. A surface of a tape sphere would be a complete closed two-dimensional manifold. Now, I can put many reference frames on that. I can choose any country on that latitude. I can um, share time with France, uh, Czech Republic, Russia, United States, etc. And even China can get into the act. Uh, we can take different kinds of arbitrary uh, units of measurements like meters and impress it into that system. But in the reality, we are in a manifold, a measurement manifold. But then again, we can't get very egocentric when we start worrying about these manifolds because we start looping across the reality of gravitational equipotentials and magnetic fields. We begin to realize that a three-dimensional manifold uh, is rather more complex in the real world. And this is the reality of our measurements. Complexities, curvilinear. There are no rectilinear, per se, uh, relationships, that, except in the near local vicinity. So if we want to get from a point of view of any particular person, let's say, let's take that little bird we saw initially. We're doing a bank. He's got a bank view of, his, of the world from his specific location and reference point. We could transfer it to another bird, say off another solar system flying around, or a thing that flaps around in the sky, let's not call it a bird. We can get to that thing's point of view through a simple, well, I shouldn't say simple, because physicists can make their whole career out of these transformations. We can make a tra mathematical transformation. It's very smooth and, and what we call differentiable. So we can relate from one point of view to another point of view, anywhere within this three-dimensional manifold that we exist in. So this is giving you an idea of what we mean about where we are. You understand that points of view are absolutely and totally purely relative. Coordinate origins and reference frames are absolutely and totally referential and relative. Then the obfuscate the situation a little bit. Einstein threw in the concept that, hey, there's really a fourth dimension plane out there, the dimension of time. And then based upon the amount of velocity that we have relative to another reference frame, we have a rotation 
of time in the space, when you take that rotation, you have strange things such as time dilation and space contraction. Now, for those of you who are not used to these kind of transformations, let me point out how a rotation from one dimension into another dimension can make you actually measure and see contraction in space and a lengthening of existence. Rotation of space in the time. We have a reference frame. Let's say we stood behind on Earth and was in this reference frame. But in the proper, proper reference frame with a fast moving object, we look at an event. Space time gives you events, say the duration of a lifetime. Our duration of a lifetime proceeds for a certain length. And let's say our height is a certain height. If, as I go faster and faster this rotation, we see from Earth that our lifespan is in fact length. See, this length, this length is longer than this length. We see time dilation. We see a contra contracting uh, of our height. As I live longer, I guess shorter. Well, we all used to that. But this is an extra shortness. You can see our length decreases the length in the direction of which we are traveling. So this gives you an idea of the relativeness of when we say, where is there? Well, when I developed this lecture, I set out to try to figure out how can I get body to dreaming about heaven? Well, how can I give meaning to where is there? And so I did the complete paper and I gave it to a few reviewers. One particular reviewer, who I will not mention, it's up for them to identify themselves. See, I was, had great trepidations about using as evidence near-death experiences. Why? Because they're controversial. Uh, some bad science has occurred there, some good science. Some people with um, agendas shaping the results are there. It takes a great discernment, both spiritually and physically, to be able to use near-death experiences. So it's not without controversy. It had great trepidation. The head of the Department of Philosophy down at Christian College did a major paper in near-death experiences, and I said, well, if he can do it, I guess I can do it. So here I am. But nonetheless, I had great trepidations of using this as a body of information to explore where is there and the stuff, uh, how we measure the there. So one of my primary reviewers looked at it, came back, and could critique various points, but never critique my use of near-death experiences. Well, it seems that person had a near-death experience. And it seems so matter-factual. It was shaping uh, a shaping element of his life. But so matter of fact, the reality of the of the event. So I take it as a as a guide to go fearlessly forward. Well, when these people experience near death, ex these near death, they come back and they tell talk to us about what happened, but recognize that the manifold, space-time manifold, which we exist in, is the framework of our measurement. Uh, it's the basis which we make experience. It is the cradle of our languages. Everything we say and do is from our experience here. Now, here is space, what we call physical dimensions of space and time. But we talk of spiritual dimensions. We all of us, in various ways, talk of spiritual dimensions. And I'm separating our use of ethical and religious terms of spiritual dimensions and mean something which parallels the measurements of existence. 